um, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, Buddhist Gem Fellowship, uh, especially to uh, Didi Bobby, who has um, been uh, putting this talk together. Um, and uh, I'm very happy that, uh, you know, with, uh, with the opportunity for being here uh, this Sunday morning, I'd first like to say, you know, a big thank you to uh, the organizers who are making this happen. Uh, I think it's very nice to be part of a very um, a good um, Sunday morning where we, we you know, we, we, we come together. Uh, despite the lockdown, we are still virtually together uh, and we are trying to have a sense of community. And I, I feel very uh, inspired that we are still making efforts to provide uh, people with, a, with this sense that we have an opportunity to come together and practice as a community. So thank you all for that. Um, I first, uh, before I, you know, before I say anything, I'd like to first of all say that, um, hang on, let me just get my views correct. <laughs> so um, the opportunity that I have today, uh, or rather the things that I have done today um, would not have been possible if I did not have the right conditions that have, um, you know, made it possible for me to be here. Um, I'd like to express my gratitude to uh, my mentors uh, who have uh, guided me uh, tremendously in my early years, as well as even today, they continue to guide me. Um, since uh, we are here uh, in Buddhist Gem Fellowship, i like to pay my uh, respect and also my gratitude to uh, Dato Sri, uh, Dr. Victor Wee, um, who has uh, been my friend and mentor for the for a very long time. I have met him when he first came back from the UK, uh, you know, when he got his PhD and, I, and we established a good friendship that lasted many years since then. That was the late 90s. And I, I think I've considered him my mentor, uh, both in terms of the Dharma as well as music and many other areas. So I'd like to, first of all, uh, say that, you know, thanks for that. And uh, interesting that just now, you know, during the prelude, we actually saw the slides and we were listening to very nice tunes from uh, the Wayfarers. And those were the music that I grew up when I was a young boy in Subhanjaya Buddhist Association um, as I listened to all the music. So uh, due to that period of time, uh, having been inspired by the music at that point in time, I also wrote a few songs of my own. And then later, I, of course, I produced some albums. But what I want to bring this up is that those little things that happened in my childhood and also later on in my university years as I joined uh, the Inkova and then I, I moved on to other things as well. Every aspect, every part of my life, I do find that I have been inspired somewhat by something. So um, it could be a Dharma speaker that has been very inspirational. It could be the music that I listened to that actually inspired me to, wow, you know, I really want to practice this. I really want to get deeper into this thing called Dharma. And, um, and so due to those little inspirations, I am today inspired. And because I'm inspired, I find that I'm doing a lot more than what I'm, what I'm you know, uh, uh, used to doing. And I hope that with my little um, contribution today, um, perhaps I can you know, offer some kind of inspiration for all of you who are watching uh, there. And I invite you to be part of this uh, inspiring uh, day. And we need inspiration because uh, in my you know, uh, own little practice of Dharma, I do find inspiration helps me to stay connected. Inspiration helps me to stay focused on the path. Inspiration helps me to keep going when the times are tough. And inspiration helps me to remember the Dharma no matter what situation. So we need inspiration more than we need knowledge actually. Yeah, especially in times like this during this pandemic. <laughs> okay, so before I begin uh, my sharing proper, uh, I'd like to first of all pay homage and uh, express also gratitude to the Buddha. And, uh, and the Buddha has always been the source of all inspiration. So allow me to just uh, pay homage to him and uh, then I'll proceed with what I want to say. Yeah. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa 
नमो तस्स भगवतो अरहतो सम्मा संबुद्धस yeah okay so um yeah uh, and i what i'm doing today is essentially not literally doing just a presentation but it is an invitation more than anything and i invite all of you who are watching on facebook to be part of this and i always believe that any dharma sharing is a good opportunity for both sides the person who listens to the dharma it is an opportunity to to not only to learn but to deepen and maybe derive some kind of inspiration and hopefully some aha moments if we can for the person like me uh, doing the delivery it is also an opportunity for me to deepen my own practice so as i uh, do the dharma talk i i i do need to do a little bit of research i do need to find uh, the the materials and i more than anything if i want to really you know do a good one i really need to dig deep into my personal experiences and maybe share with you one or two things that maybe you may resonate with you so uh through this uh i hope i invite you to be part of this uh practice together and if you do have any comments or any questions uh, please feel free to comment in the comment section or say something or even ask questions even if you don't want to ask uh you know deep questions it's fine you know even if it's a simple question it is related to practice so today uh, my topic as has been introduced to you is this okay. so i have been um last week i did a similar sharing in uh, subanjaya buddhist association uh, although i focused on a different aspect but um and for the last few months i have been doing dharma sharing concerning habits and uh, why i choose this topic is quite simple really um in times like we are in the lockdown situation uh we are pretty much locked in uh, and we spend a lot of time at home whether on our own or with our immediate family members or you know whatever it is and you find that we 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 don't really have much to do and all we have a lot to do but we can't go anywhere and in times like this i do find if we are not careful we can develop quite unskillful habits uh such as worrying um getting agitated getting frustrated getting impatient boredom and things like that and due to all these unskillful e uh, emotions and mental qualities you find that uh, it is very easy to manifest in some kind of we call it bad habits <laughs> okay such as uh simple things such as forwarding unverified news is uh, one of the key habits i find very prevalent in today's uh, lock in and lockdown situation we forward things everywhere even though rumors we see it and then we we all we see a news and then we get very agitated and we just want to tell you know to, to tell the world and after a while it creates some kind of uh you know uh, un un unwelcome kind of uh, emotions around so i want to share with you uh that this is very important because developing skillful qualities or skillful habits become a very crucial part of the practice and in the buddha's teaching he emphasizes this a lot although he doesn't use the word habits but he emphasizes the qualities the practice uh you know and and the way in which we conduct ourselves whether mentally physically or verbally uh they are all there all right so and the question we ask is what is the single most desired thing that we want in life how do we get them i think you know so those of you who are listening and you have seen this talk uh, earlier uh bear with me uh, the first few slides because later i share something different but the first few slides are quite similar but i for those of you who are watching for the first time I, this is just an overview and uh so if we look at this question and we answer what do i really want and how do i get them do i want to have something that looks like this okay that means oh no you know uh this is so bad i i'm so I, my life is in a you know in a in a terrible time i don't have you know, i don't have uh, good things and uh i'm so unlucky i'm so uh unfortunate i haven't got my vaccination <laughs> okay uh, i'm speaking for myself actually I, I every day i've been reminded by my family members please check the 
you know, your my Sajatra and please check this and please check that. And, and I've been checking everything and I'm still not getting anything. So, and people have been telling me, how come? Why not? How come? As if it's my fault. <laughs> so, so anyway, this, this, this is what I want, you know, uh, some kind of unhappiness, some kind of uh, despair, you know, full of anxiety, full of worry, full of anger, full of agitation. It's so easy to fall into this. Of course, that's not what I want. That's not what we want. And what we want, of course, is to be something like this, isn't it? Uh, something that we can be proud of to say, I'm happy. I'm at ease. I'm good. I'm all right. And you want that kind of feeling. And it doesn't help sometimes when I see my friends getting vaccinated and they post selfies about themselves. <laughs> and then they, they sort of say, you know, wow, you know, and then we ask well, which one, which vaccine, or this vaccine is better than that vaccine and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, at the end, it doesn't help me. I may fall to the left side a lot more. But if I were to ask myself, what do I really want is to be on the right side, the one that gives, that, that is, puts a smile on my face. And, and of course, how do I get that with so many things going on? We all want that. We all want to have more of this and less of, you know, the other side and less of negative qualities. So if we say we want this, then we need to ask ourselves, and I, I, I also ask myself this very important question. Can I obtain happiness and well-being by praying, by wishing, by, you know, uh, fixing something? We try to fix things. A lot of time when we are very unhappy, we try to fix things around us and try to make things so that we ourselves uh, can be so-called creating the condition. But these are external conditions. Sometimes external conditions does not contribute to lasting happiness and well-being. We know this. And yet we do that all the time. We try to make that happen all the time. So if we want happiness and we want well-being, and then we need to ask ourselves that doing something can either lead to happiness or well-being. Our habits can either be good or bad, can either lead to, hap uh, to, to despair or to well-being. So we say that our habits contribute to that. And our well-being, our happiness, our peace of mind, whatever it is, depends on what we do consistently over a period of time. Okay? It is not something that happens suddenly. It is something that happens gradually. Okay? And, uh, you know, we, we, we need to, to have that, you know, in our mind. And if we say that, then we say our habits influence how we behave, which can lead to either positive or negative outcomes. Okay, so um, this is something that is quite uh, real and quite prevalent, uh, which we need to somehow understand, right? Uh, so if we want well-being, we want happiness, we say we need to work on our habits, right? Habits are the very foundation that which have a cause to our well-being or happiness. Or the habits can contribute to something that leads to despair, unhappiness, uh, more unhappiness, more anxiety, and things like this. So it, then we say it pays to work on our habits. We know that our habits have a lot of impact on our life. So sometimes, sometimes some people ask, you know, we look at our, ourselves and say, why do some people's life just don't, they don't, they don't get, despite they have all the things in the world that they have, uh, the comforts, the money, and uh, all the right conditions, good family members, good friends, a good career, and yet they are un unhappy. And if you examine lives like this, and you can ask yourself, among all my friends, who are the ones who are successful and who are not? Who are the ones who are better or who are more at ease and who are not? And those who are not at ease, you find that normally they have some bad habits, <laughs> some unskillful qualities that they keep repeating over a period of time. So let's define what is habit. A habit is something that we do often and regularly, sometimes without knowing that you're doing it. Okay? It is, it is something quite unconscious, really, uh, although we can be conscious of it, but most of the time, our energy, all right, it, it will keep on driving us even though we say we don't want. 
Let me give you one example. I, okay, this is a joke that I told also last week, but I think I like to tell this one again because I find it very funny. <laughs> and um, um, I don't know if you get it, but uh, the, the joke goes like this. You know, uh, there's this particular person who uh, who had disembarked from his uh, plane, and he arrived in a country that he didn't, you know, he he probably uh, didn't uh, didn't know very well, but he knows the country, but he's not very familiar with the roads. So he he called for a taxi, and the taxi, you know, he went into the taxi, and this cab driver took him on a ride. And as they were moving, and as they were driving, this taxi driver was driving, and he was um, driving for some time. And uh, after a while, the passenger uh, looks at it and says, "This cannot be right. It normally doesn't take less uh, more than fifteen minutes, but it's taking around forty-five minutes, and he's still not reaching the destination. Something's wrong." And he noticed that the the cab driver turn into a road that seems very unfamiliar and things like that so so he and the passenger of course went and and uh, you know to the front and he tapped the shoulder of the taxi driver and after tapping the shoulder of the taxi driver suddenly the taxi driver lost control of the car and he, he you know instead of braking he accelerated and he crashed into a, a tree and that's of course uh, they both of them were unharmed it's just just the, the car was damaged and they were both shocked. Of course, after a while, the passenger asked the cab driver, "Hey, you know, I just tapped on your shoulder. How come you're you're reacting in such a such a big way?" And the cab driver just looked at him and says, "You know, today is my first day as a taxi driver. For the last twenty years, I've been driving the hearse. You know, the funeral <laughs> car." So. <laughs> So I don't know if you got that, that joke because I can't see any of you. So anyway, I have, to, I have to assume you got the joke. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make is it's a habit. It's a habit which is unconscious. We do it uh, we, without really knowing about it. So, but the good news is, and this the, the good news about it is, habits can be developed, whether good or bad. The bad news is if you don't do anything, Bad habits tend to take over. Just like if you don't do anything to your garden, weeds will grow. All right? But if you do something consistently, regularly to your garden, uh, such as uh, pruning the, 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 you know, the, the, uh, or rather cutting the, 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 the grass, pulling out the weeds and keeping it neat and tidy and all that, then the, your garden seems, you know, we have some, some flourishing and things like this. So, uh, and we know yeah, it, it, it takes care and attention and time and effort to do these things. Okay, so so we have two kinds of habits. We have the bad habits and we have the good habits. And in uh, you know, according to the Buddha, the, the bad habits are what we call Ahusala Dhamma or unskillful qualities. The qualities that are not skillful. Akusala means unskillful. Uh, unwholesome, if you if you want to use a stronger word, but I like the word unskillful. And um, good habits are kusala dhamma. Okay, it's the opposite. They are the skillful qualities, wholesome qualities. Okay, the akusala dhamma, unskillful qualities, leads to negative outcomes. Usually, it leads to not so good outcomes. Skillful ones lead to more positive outcomes. So. It is to our advantage if we want well-being, we want happiness, we want success, that we focus a lot more on our good ones, the skillful ones, and reduce as much as we can the unskillful ones. And this is not what I say. This is what the Buddha says. And the Buddha says that uh, you know we need to increase the good things, the, the kusala, and reduce the akusala. Okay? Uh, this is the practice. So if you ask what's the practice of Buddhism, really, it's all about this, you know, abandoning the unskillful, cultivate and develop the skillful. Those are the practice. And of course, the, the last one is actually to cultivate the mind, uh, the quality of the mind that will be the cause of all the habitual things that we do. Yeah. So, and the Buddha goes on further. How do you know what is Akusala? How do you know what is Kusala? And the Buddha has given very, very precise and almost flawless explanation. The Buddha says that 
our unskillful qualities are having the unskillful roots and the unskillful roots are, uh, are what we call the, the the three unskillful roots and the three unskillful roots some people call it the evil roots but the evil i you know, evil you know have a have a different kind of connotation so i prefer to use unskillful or unwholesome and they are loba dosa moha loba frequently translated as greed uh, or if you look at it from a, a personal perspective it is one thing to have something you don't currently have that's greed that's that's one thing you know thirsting for it desiring for it and these all are what we call loba greed yeah uh, in one word greed but i like to explain it a little bit you always want to have something else okay we always have this thing of, i'm not satisfied with what i have i want to have something else and dosa is frequently translated as hatred wanting to get rid of something we don't like this is exactly what the buddha say is the core is, is what we call dukkha we experience dukkha because we want to have something we don't have and we want to get rid of something that we we don't like okay uh, these are the roots of our unskillful habits or unskillful qualities moha is delusion ignorance not knowing not aware and thinking that our bad habits nothing wrong ma. that's the worst of course uh, and you know delusion happens because we we are like this um we have this unconscious thing that thinking that things are going fine now so i don't think i need to do much you know things are good going fine now so anyway uh what to do these are who i this is who i am i'm like that one ma. you know my habit is like this so you know uh you you can't tell me you know that i'm wrong you know but of course according to the buddha this is something not skillful all right and some people even justify <clears throat> just to tell you just to lighten up the moment uh some people i you know some things i saw on facebook to say some people like to of course these are jokes but some you know sometimes if you justify our bad habits through things like this <laughs> for example procrastination is a bad habit of you know that says i don't procrastinate i wait until the last minute to do things because i will be older and <laughs> therefore wise <laughs> so again these are examples of what we call delusion uh, these are just memes people put on on Facebook. Uh, uh, the fact that I procrastinate and still get the job done is the reason I still procrastinate. And some people do this because, hey, I do my best work at the last minute. So you know, don't tell me, you know, don't tell me about not procrastinating. I do my best work there. Nothing wrong with that, but it's just that we justify it, okay? And uh, <laughs> procrastination is totally a good thing. You always have something to do tomorrow. Plus, you have nothing to do today, so. Just an example to show you how deluded sometimes we can be uh, because and these lead us to have even further unskillful qualities so uh, so we recognize the roots of our unskillful qualities are loba dosa moha frequently translated greed hatred delusion you want to have something you don't have you want to get rid of something you don't like and you are not aware or you think that it's all right you justify all your actions okay that's delusion now there are also if you look at the, the the other side if you want to develop skillful qualities then you need to understand that skillful qualities have their roots in skillful roots good roots okay and the good roots are the opposite a loba a dosa a moha when you put the word a there means it's not okay non-greed non-hatred non-delusion okay non-greed or contentment going beyond gratifying the senses being content with what we have uh are those are non-hatred care kindness concern about the well-being for oneself or myself and the well-being of others and non-delusion means you have the right mindset about the habits having right view some ditti having right attitude right intention right right uh yeah, right intention yeah uh sama sangkapa. these two things are very important because if you don't have this we will keep justifying that my bad habits are still all right nothing wrong my life is okay but if we say no actually life is not exactly okay we need to find a way to have a good life a well-being and that's what the buddha says 
the 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 problem of dukkha must be solved. So when we look at all these things, we say that um, we have the three unskillful roots, which are loba, dosa, moha. Three skillful roots are loba, a dosa, a moha, which sums up what we mean by akusala, dhamma, and kusala dhamma. Unskillful qualities and skillful uh, qualities, which needs to be developed. So the Buddha has laid out his plan for us. Once we have the right mindset, then the rest is about practicing. So uh, I've taken this aspect of the Noble Eightfold Path called Samma Vayama, or we call it right effort. And here the Buddha did emphasize this, you know, in what, what, what I mentioned earlier, the Buddha is mentioning this, and this is coming from, from the Buddha's, uh, you know, ancient uh, teachings. So let's see what is the meaning of Samma Vayama. And these are the words of the Buddha. Words of the Buddha says, and what is right effort? It's when a bhikkhu or a, a monastic uh, generates enthusiasm, tries, make an effort, exerts the mind, strives so that bad, unskillful qualities don't arise. Okay, uh, There's a lot of words here, but I think it's, it's, it is quite important to recognize this. We have unskillful qualities that have not arisen. We have to make our uh, an effort not to let them arise. Then we say they generate enthusiasm, try, make an effort, exert the mind, and strive so that bad, unskillful qualities that have already arisen are given up. Okay, so uh, if if it is uh, already there, we have to give them up. That's what it means. So we have two two aspects. One is the habit that not yet there, potentially can be there. The other habit is already there. They have already arisen. We have to find a way to, to give them up. And the Buddha goes on further to say, they generate enthusiasm, try, make an effort, exert the mind and strive so that the skillful qualities that have not yet arisen arise. We know these are potential to, to arise. We make them arise. Okay, we, 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 we acquire them. and they generate enthusiasm, try, make an effort, exert the mind, and strive so that skillful qualities that have already arisen, they're already there, remain, are not lost, but increase, mature, fulfilled by development. This is so... Four sentences by the Buddha, but a lot of profound meaning here. Because this is a framework for our practice. If you, if you look at it from this angle, it's the Buddha is not just saying things for the sake of saying things. The Buddha is giving us a framework, a method, a way to structure things, if you can you know, look at it, so that we see it as a whole and we know there are two aspects. What do we do with them? Okay, so, and I've taken this and the next few slides are, are what I call my own little way and method. I, I try to you know, visualize this and I invite you to do the same if you want to. I have put this into a visual perspective. Okay, so Sama Vayama, I, I just simply put it into a, this is what I call a matrix or a table, whatever you call it. And, and you can do this. Take out a piece of paper if you want uh, and draw you know, if you want to fold it in four and draw this, these four boxes. And on the, on, the, on the top side, you can see, you can label them bad habits or unskillful qualities. And then you label it as skillful, right? Unskillful and skillful. And then on this side, all right, on the left side, you say it's those that are arisen or present or not yet arisen, potential. Now, the Buddha has given his description there, our Habits can be divided into two. Those are, that are already present in us, those that have not yet in us. So they are potential. Okay? And if you place this out here, you can do, do this. And what we can do now is to identify them and put them in the boxes. Now, I find this practice quite useful, at least for me, because these days we are very visual people. And uh, of course, the, 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 the tradition of Buddhism is more of oral tradition. We, we tend to listen 
and they try to remember and then we try to internalize and all that. And perhaps in the ancient days, people have a lot more uh, ability to listen and even visualize. But today we are living in a very visual world. We watch a lot of videos. <laughs> we, we spend a lot of time reading and, 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 and scrolling on our social media uh, on YouTube and things like this. So we have cultivated a lot more um, visual habits. Okay, so it, it, it's helpful if we can try to put a lot more visual things. That's why we, we use, make use of diagrams. We make use of, uh, you know, um, pictures to illustrate a point. So this is a visual tool that I think uh, I've taken what the Buddha has said and put it out here. So what you can do is you can start to identify them and put them down. This is an example of what I would have done. Okay, so I try to list down those unskillful qualities that are already present in me for example like for me procrastination is a big one so i put that up front is it's one unskillful habit so if you have any one that is you think yeah la, I, I my habit is not very helpful then on that piece of paper or your journal there write it down you know i find writing down things very helpful because these days we forget things very easily so we rely on our memory memory is unreliable uh, things that we think that we, we remember, we don't really remember. So it helps to, to, to write things down. And to me, I find it helpful. You know, I, you can do the same. Uh, the other big one that I think I, I has been, has people have helped me to identify is, uh, interrupting people before they finish what they're saying. And I find this, oh, this is a habit that I already have. And let's put it out there. And getting impatient, getting agitated easily. It is a habit that perhaps you may have. So you put it down there. Yeah, I am. Uh, yeah, like, I admit I am. And this one, you can do that. Overindulgence in sense pleasures, all right? Uh, such as, you know, overwatching, uh, uh, you know, TV. Uh, now we don't watch TV, but we watch Netflix and whatever other flicks we have. Uh, or watching YouTube uh, videos and overindulgence in those things and things like that. And we find that it is not helpful. And we know these habits are already present in us. So this is on the on the left, top left uh, one. You can do the same with the other boxes. And I find this, for example, uh, you know that there are some unskillful qualities that have not yet arisen. So for example, for me, I know that indulgence in alcohol is a potential bad habit, which is not yet in me but i know it can potentially be there because the temptations are there so i put it down there and uh uh you know forwarding unverified news via social media is something i don't currently do uh which but i, I used to do that a lot but now i don't but i know it's potentially still there which if i'm not careful i can it can be a it can it can go up it can go up to the one that you know that is here so uh so i and and so on. Again, you might want to list down those potential uh, qualities that you you think I don't have them now, but I think if I'm not careful, they can or they can you know I can pick it up. Okay, so we can do that. So if you want to try to uh, scribble something down there. Now you can do the same with what you call your skillful qualities. The skillful qualities that have already arisen. You may have some of them. Uh, I find some of these already present in me. For example, uh, expressing gratitude to others. Um, I never used to have this quality that much when I, you know, my early years. But these days, I do find that quality has already been cultivated in me. So I have that already. But it's not a lot. But I, I do have some of it. Okay, put it down. Let's recognize what good habits I currently have. And this is a good practice as well. Because sometimes we think that we are not good. We have so many bad qualities, but what about the good ones? We do have, no matter how slight, no matter how small. I used to be a very impatient person, but now I think I, I'm slightly more patient, maybe due to uh, age mellowing and things like that. So uh, then, 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 then I do have that. Recognize I do have some skillful qualities that have already been there. Daily meditation practice, I picked this up Believe it or not, during the pandemic, uh, ever since the MCO, I have been, you know, uh, trying to consistently practice meditation, trying to be making it a daily affair. So I have that already. So, okay, let's recognize that is a quality I have. 
and things like this. And you can do that. And this is a very, very powerful way to recognize the good qualities in ourselves. And we also then recognize that there are those skillful qualities, good qualities that have potential to be there, which I want to pick up. If you look at it, it could be, uh, uh, you know, uh, the opposite of our unskillful ones, you know, letting other people finish what they're saying, uh, doing first things first, not procrastinating, having mudita, joy for other success and things like this. So we know that there are also qualities that we want to pick up. What are those helpful, skillful qualities that you would like to have that you find is not yet already in you yet, but is something you want to have? Put it down there. Now, I emphasize this kind of thing because what the Buddha has given is an overview. What we need to do is to take the Buddha's advice and to apply this in a very simple, down-to-earth uh, way. I find this helpful because it helps me to be more focused. If I don't start to identify them in terms of the, the kind of qualities, what do those what are those qualities, I probably may not pay attention to them. Yeah, it's just I know I know I got some some unskillful qualities, I know I got some skillful qualities, I know what the Buddha said, I know what I must do. These are theory. Theory alone does not help us in practice. What helps us in practice is we start to internalize that theory, internalize what it means, and try, if we can, to put it into perspective of what it means to us on a day-to-day -day basis. Lay people like us, these are common. Right? These qualities that we I pointed out here are quite common to most of us. And I do believe it, they are. Right? So let's let's recognize this. Now let's uh look at this from this angle. So I hope you have done this because um it, it, it helped me. I hope it helps you. But if you think you you know it already, that's fine also. But I do find having a visual format does help me. So what do we do when we have things like this? Then we say that we need to recognize which side is more. Maybe the, the, the left side is more <laughs> than the good side. <laughs> so sometimes you, 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 you may not have a lot on the right side. Then you know that the left side is, 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 is big. Or we find that the right side can be more. It depends on you. Some of you have cultivated and consistently cultivated good things and good qualities and good habits. Over a period of time, you may find that your good habits overshadow the bad ones. But for most of us, and I myself included, uh, this tends to be more. And I, <laughs> I always find that it's a struggle on a day-to-day -day basis. So I would like to aspire, if I can, to get more of the right side. And this is exactly what the Buddha is saying to us. I'm just taking the Buddha's words and putting it into a lot more, maybe a, a visual format for, for people like me who try to visualize it a lot more systematically uh, so that it helps me at least to be more focused in my practice. Okay. So then the next question to ask is, what do we do next? So once I have identified them, once I have recognized them, then the practice is about doing something about them. So what is the Buddha's advice? The Buddha's advice is, based on that, uh, I have given an acronym here. I'll explain to you what it means. Buddha's advice in Sama Vayama can be summed up as follows. For those unskillful habits that are already arisen, already present in us, then we, prob we can tell ourselves to reduce them, abandon them, minimize them, right? Uh, I, I have an unskillful quality called uh, getting uh, agitated easily. So it's already very, very present in me. I find it very easily. I get agitated over the smallest things. So I need to re reduce, abandon it if I can, minimize it, you know? Uh, how do I do that? I need to apply the right kind of uh, mindset to say this is not helpful. Uh, Any time some of this, uh, you know, agitation arise, I tell myself, "Hang on, I know uh, this is not right. I know this is not proper. Can I not get so agitated? Maybe on a scale of one to ten, I used to be a ten. 
<laughs> but this this time around, can I reduce it to an eight? And then slowly, maybe from a uh, from from eight, every time the next agitation happens, I get get it down to a, a seven, six point five, five, and if I can get it below five, even better. So it's a gradual training process of reducing, minimizing, abandoning the unskillful qualities to the level that we find that it is not as real or apparent. Okay. For those skill, uh, unskillful habits that have not yet arisen, but they are potential to arise, then the, 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 the best thing we can do is to have restraint, virati, uh, staying away. Yeah? Uh, that's why the, the five precepts are uh, uh, always ends with veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Veramani is to, to avoid, to, uh, to, to, to sort of uh, restrain ourselves, to refrain from it. Sikha uh, padang is to, is a practice. Sikha. Sikha is a practice. And then, samadhi, uh, I apply myself in the practice of abandoning or restraining itself. So the, really the five precepts are to abandon the unskillful qualities that have not yet arisen. Potentially we can kill, we can lie, we can steal, we can do all kinds of things, but we don't do that. So, we, we keep do, keep on not doing it. It's a restraint. Right? So, this is one of the ways the Buddha tells us in Sama Vayama, what is right effort. For those skillful qualities that already arisen, we have them already. We recognize, I have some quality. Then, that is to be developed. What does it mean? Nurture, cultivate, increase, spend more time, do more. So if I have a habit of already doing daily meditation, for example, and some of you may have that, that habit already, our role for those habits that we consider skillful is to just keep doing it, developing it. So, uh, and, and not allow these things to, to diminish. So if you don't do anything to develop them, you find that it can diminish. Just like muscles in our body, if the muscles are not exercised, you're not developing them, over a period of time, the, the, the muscles actually go to sleep. I find it very, uh, for me myself, because I, I do have some, some aches and pains uh, in some of the muscle. And I find that it's because over a period of time, uh, maybe during my early years, I didn't pay attention to them. So now <laughs> it starts to manifest as some kind of pain. So those muscles that you don't use, uh, it, it, it can deteriorate. So those skillful habits that have already been there, develop them, nurture them, cultivate them, increase them, do more of them. For those skillful habits that have not yet arisen, then it is to arouse them, generate them, learn, invest in them. So one of the habits, if you think that, you know, I, I probably I don't do enough dana, lah. <laughs> you know, uh, always take but don't give enough, then I know it's a good habit to have. So what must I do? Find opportunities to do them. Okay. So that is a very, very important thing to do. So these four things which I have given here uh, is a sum up of what the Buddha is trying to tell us in a more maybe uh, straightforward way. Uh, so if we can do these four things, uh, we say that over a period of time, as we gradually practice it, you will find that as a person, at least I find for myself, uh, I have a lot more sense that I'm more balanced. I'm more at ease. I don't get frustrated, anxious too often, too quickly. I don't raise my voice too, too much and things like this. So uh, that, that I find, I can only testify for myself because I practiced this over a, a period of time, uh, it helped me to, you know, to be more, uh, I, I would say more grounded, more focused. And this is exactly what the Buddha's path is. The Buddha's path is not a path for us to just admire. The Buddha's path is a practical, actionable path. It's not something that we just know. It is to develop that path. And I've given you just earlier the, 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 the tool for you to use if you want to. Uh, it helped me. I hope it helps you. 
Um, then I have put down here in a more, uh, maybe a more, again, uh, a way in which we can redefine what, or not redefine, but just to echo what the Buddha is saying, Sama Vayama. Now, I want to take this one step further. Yeah, I know this already. So what do I do next? Now, if you really want to see results, if you really want to see that these things are put in practice, then we need to have a, 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 a call to action. Okay, a call to action includes having what we call an, a personal action plan. Okay, so by putting on a personal action plan, then whatever is being mentioned here can be put into a more down-to-earth, day-to-day practice. How do we do this? One of the things that I have done is we got so many qualities that we want to abandon or to develop. You can't possibly do everything at once. I don't think it's possible. I think it's a bit too ambitious if we say, I want to, you know, from now on be a saint and cultivate all the good qualities and abandon all the bad qualities. And I want to be good immediately just like this. The Buddhist path is not like this. It's a gradual path. So by gradual, it means it is a step by step one. It is not a sudden one. You don't get sudden enlightenment. You get enlightenment by practicing over a period of time. You don't get sudden samadhi, stillness of mind. You don't get to do that immediately. You need to gradually lead to stillness, just like a pond of water that when you disturb it, there are ripples in the lake and it takes a, a little bit of time before it settles. It's not suddenly settled. You can't. Okay. So what I can, what I recommend you do and what I have done personally is I choose the ones that I feel I want to work on. I want to pay attention to. For example, you may choose a few of these habits and they become your focus. So you may not want to be too focused on the others yet, although there are something to work on, but you tell yourself, look, at least for the next few months, maybe three months, six months, one year, depending on your timeline is really depending on how, on yourself, what is comfortable for you, all right? Uh, some people are very ambitious. Next one week, I'm going to be different, <laughs> okay? Oh, well, if you can, but for me, I find it, it doesn't, yeah, normally it takes about a month or two before some habits actually sink in. Um, but anyway, uh, what we're, what the whole principle of this is, you choose the ones that are more important, maybe more crucial, maybe more critical. And then you, you sort of, you know, you, you put it out there. And once you have chosen them, then, at least for me, I try to have a personal action plan. For example, if let's say, you know, procrastination and, and, uh, it's, it's already a, a habit that I, I, I think, you know, I've been procrastinating my meditation practice for the longest time. You know, for years, I've been telling myself I must meditate more. And it's only last year that I started to be more regular. Not that I didn't do it in the past, but it was not regular. These days, it became more regular. And, uh, and, and I wonder what have I been doing in the past? I've been putting it off for the longest time. So anyway, the habit of quality is to be chosen from here. And what you can do is you put it down to a, a list and the personal action plan is for me to sort of say, what do I need to do in order to cultivate? For example, if let's say procrastination and it's a problem, it's a, it's a unskillful quality I have, a, a skillful one is the opposite of them to do first thing first, to not procrastinate. Then my action plan here is to do my weekly planning every Sunday evening to list and prioritize the important things to pay attention repeat the routine every week for the next four weeks and see what happens. And at least for me, I find that I've done so and I, I don't procrastinate as much. <laughs> I still procrastinate, but I don't procrastinate too much. So I'm reducing uh, my unskillful quality. That, that's how you take that personal practice into something more actionable. Uh, for example, uh, let's say, you, 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 you have a practice of expressing gratitude to others. You already have that good quality, good habit. Fine. How can you do it more? So the personal action plan is keep nurturing by expressing thanks to more people apart from the familiar ones. So you need, so I'm telling myself to expand my gratitude practice to encompass more people, not just the people I'm comfortable with. Okay. 
So, um, and I perhaps put a personal challenge to myself, next 14 days, I'm going to do this more. I'm going to find people to say thanks to and things like this. So, so you make that into a, a good uh, habit. Uh, for example, daily meditation practice. So uh, you start off by, with 15 minutes and then tell yourself, if I want to do this more, then I increase my duration. I, or I, I do, you know, I do it uh, more and I try to cultivate more and things like this. So, and do the same with any other habit or quality that you identified and putting it down into practice. Okay, so now I've given quite a lot of tips and tools here. I just want to recap uh, for you. Let me stop the share. That at the end of the day, uh, the Buddhist practice is not complicated, but yet it's not simple either. Unfortunately, the the least complicated it is, the more difficult it is to do. <laughs> okay, uh, it looks so straightforward. It looks so simple, and it's so and yet it. What the Buddha is trying to say is it can be done. How to do it is just to ensure that all those things that we are doing are put into what we call actionable items. Practicing the Buddhist path is not admiring or worshipping or, you know, and, and if we want good things to happen, that, that work has to be done. Uh, and let me just recap what I have just said much earlier. Uh, first of all, recognize that there are such things called unskillful and skillful qualities. Uh, then the next thing to, to do is to um, uh, know that those skill, unskillful ones have roots in the unskillful roots, greed, hatred, delusion. Uh, skillful ones, they are the opposite. Okay, uh, Their roots are more pleasant, more wholesome, more skillful. Uh, then the practice is to recognize and identify those qualities that are unskillful and skillful, whether they are present in us or not yet present in us. They are either present or they are potential. You recognize them. Okay. If you want to list them, list them. Once that is listed, then apply it into practice. Choose the ones that you feel is, uh, is uh, critical, is important, or at least you think can do something about. Put it down there. Make it a priority. Give it importance. Once you give something importance, then there's a, the fuel will be there for us to apply ourselves in the practice. Okay. So, and uh, I like to say that uh, Ajahn Brahm has this uh, simile and analogy to say that it is not a sudden thing. Something that needs to be done gradually over a period of time. The story he says is, uh, you know, for example, if somebody were to go to the factory and do a work, so you go to the factory, this, this person goes to the factory and he does his work for the day and he works very hard in the factory and at the end of the day, he finishes his work, he goes home and he was not paid a single cent. Okay. So he says, okay, never mind. Maybe I go to work the second day, they will pay me. And so he goes to work the second day. And again, he works very hard. This time he's worked extra hard, puts all his effort into it, thinking that by now people should recognize my effort. And he finishes his work for the day, he goes home and he was not paid anything. And he gets a little bit frustrated and agitated. This is not happening. Why am I working so hard for? Anyway, I still got nothing else. So I go back to work on the third day. And on the third day, I go back. He goes back and he works hard. This time he's worked even harder than before because maybe by today, they should be able to pay me. And he works extra hours that day. By the time he finishes his work, he goes back. He was not paid a single cent. By this time, this man is about to give up. He's about to give up. He's telling himself, this is not uh, right. I, I don't think it's the right thing for me. Maybe I'm in the wrong job. I tell you. So anyway, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's go, let's go to the, the third, the, the fourth day. So he, he tries again. He goes to the fourth day. In this time, he just does what he thinks is right, what he thinks is proper. He still does his work, but maybe not as hard as on, on the third day. But by the end of the fourth day, Oh my goodness, still no pay. 
and by this time he feels like he just needs to quit but his wife and his family members tells him no you go back and work again because you need to do this and so he goes back to work and on the fifth day he finishes his work he does his best and before he went home his boss gave him his paycheck he got paid on the fifth day after he's done his work so the lesson is always go to work on the fifth day <laughs> no i'm just joking um, it means that you know you're not going to see much results not until we put in consistent yeah period of time the kind of effort and then you see that gradually as we train ourselves uh, we should be able to see the results over a period of time and that's what Sama Wayama, what the Buddha is trying to say here, uh, what he's trying to uh, explain. The entire path is a gradual one that needs to be cultivated gradually over a period of time. All right, so I end here my sharing. I know it's, it's, it's you know, it's, uh, I've done, you know, the, the, the part. And then what we can do now is uh, we can have a little bit of discussion if you want to or I can take a few questions if you have, um, and um, I'd like to wish you all, uh, you know, a good, uh, good practice. All right. So, thank you, and um, I'll now hand to Bobby for anything. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Didi Niwan, for your very practical advice. I particularly, like the way the way you put the habits into a table. You know, with the graph and the four quadrants, and also uh, the the way you put it into actionable steps, action plan, where we can uh, use it to gradually improve our good habits and uh, reduce bad habits. Now, brother Niwen, there are a few questions uh, coming from the Facebook. Oh, cool. <laughs> what, in your opinion, are the most common bad habits which most people have? And how can we use this pandemic period to overcome them? Uh, I, I think it's different for everybody, uh, the, the kind of bad habits or unskillful qualities. Um, I can only say that um, what are common today, I, I think co what is common to me may not be common to you, but I find uh, one, maybe we can, uh, it's not fair for me to say, it's just my own judgment, but you know, that's my, that's my disclaimer there. But I would say one of the bad habits today is forwarding of, of unverified news and messages uh, to people. Uh, my friend Didi Sengkwa is giving another talk now in uh, for MSBS, so please do catch him also because he, he is emphasizing on this particular habit called right speech. And he is, you know, in his talk, which um, you can you can also see on the recorded one on Facebook, uh, is he emphasizes that the uh, these days, uh, electronic right speech become very, very crucial to practice. And it's increasingly more difficult when information is too easily available and we find that it's so easily easy to, the, the temptation to want to share a news in the name of sharing, in the name of helping, in the name of, you know, uh, uh, telling, you know, people that, you know, that we, we want people to, 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 to know, uh, Without us verifying the, the, the source of the news, we create so much unhappiness on the ground. So this is one that I can think of. And uh, the others are what you can see for yourself anytime. I think the more important question to ask is, how do I know that a habit is unskillful or skillful? And if we look at the common unskillful habits, always have their roots in loba, dosa, moha, greed, hatred, delusion. Uh, wanting to have something we don't currently have get yeah, wanting to get rid of something we don't uh, we we don't like and 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 that is perpetuating what we call the unskillful qualities so uh the way in which we can help ourselves i think is first of all having right view summer uh that that mindset that these things are not good these things are not pleasant these things are not no matter what people say you know i let me tell you my personal experience um i do have friends who constantly bombard me with all kind of information. And sometimes the way they talk about it is as if they are, 
they are encouraging me to have bad habits. Uh, they are encouraging me to say, why you want to do, do so many of these things? Uh, yeah, chill, la, relax, la, no, no need. La, you know? uh, why you want to do so many? Why, why you need to, uh, to, to spend so much time doing this presentation? The simple one to do, just take the old one and, and do the, you know, they, en they encourage you to do, to have unskillful qualities. So once you understand this with the samadhiti, uh, having right view, then applying ourselves in the practice means these are unskillful. Uh, this is not what I want to have. And I need, I need to, uh, in today's words, we say change the narrative. <laughs> um, okay. One other tip just before the next question. One other tip I, I think is, is to, uh, surround yourself with good friends, especially good buddies that are maybe also practicing good qualities. And I think having that will help us to identify what are not so good, identify what are good, and keep us on the path of practice. I think that is perhaps very, very helpful. So I hope I answered the question in a, in a roundabout way. Yeah. Yes, uh, Brother Niwan, thank you. I was just about to suggest uh, getting a buddy to help us point out some of the weaknesses which we don't see, like the Johari's window. You highlighted that already. Very good. The Having next question is, how can mindfulness of Dharma practice reduce worldly worries and guide us to attain worldly and spiritual happiness? Is this mindfulness practice a form of escapism from reality as we are only focused on being aware of our inner thoughts and feelings without really tr facing and trying to overcome worldly problems? Uh, this is a very profound one. Uh, um, um, let me just try to get the question into perspective. Um, I think the question being asked is, um, is mindfulness practice a form of escaping from the world uh, or a form of, you know, moving away from the problems of the world and not wanting to face the world? I do not know whether that's that's the essence of what the, the, the question is. Yeah, I... Well, I think we need to also ask ourselves, what is the world? The world is the world of the senses. The world is the world of the five senses. The, most of our time is spent, if you examine ourselves, most of the time is spent gratifying the senses. Right? Um, for example, we always want something pleasant and we want to push away the unpleasant. Uh, we are always trying to get something, okay, and trying to prevent from losing something. Uh, that is typically what our normal way of operating is. The way our normal operating mode is always trying to push away the unpleasant and crave for wanting the unpleasant. So escapism is actually getting away from the unpleasant, going to the pleasant. That's why a lot of people escape. Uh, recently, you, you read the news that there are suicide cases, right? Uh, suicide cases uh, being, being quite rampant. And these are just scratching the surface of what uh, some of the more prevailing issues today. We are all having, we are all experiencing a very gross form of dukkha. We are, in a way, now we can use the word suffering, right? Okay, we are experiencing it in in a very, uh, uh, no, in a very um, uh, apparent manner. Yeah, it's very real to us. So that suicide case is a is an escapism, um, and I don't blame that person because sometimes we don't have the tools to cope with the pain that we are feeling. So. That is, in a way, escaping from the world and thinking that escaping from it is going towards our freedom, which, according to the Buddha, it's not. It does not solve the problem. The problem of dukkha is not solved by escaping. So, no, mindfulness practice is not a form of escapism. Mindfulness practice is to be recognizing the reality of the world, the reality that this is such. So, mindfulness practice is... Like today, when you receive the news, you got the news to say, we are now in EMCO. Uh, the entire Selangor is in full lockdown. You cannot go out. You cannot do this. You cannot do that. What is your first reaction? The first reaction is, uh, 
for the lack of you know, sometimes forgive my language bloody hell <laughs> you know so we, we always have this reaction we say how can this be okay, we are just getting our life on track and now they give us another bomb and how can i cope with this this is not right and then we get into it and some people get into despair so we are trying to escape from a, a something that we can't escape from and the problem of dukkha is we can't escape from it seriously not until we recognize it so uh, the direct answer to the question is mindfulness practice is not to escape from it is to recognize and uh, understand this is reality reality is subject to anicca impermanence they are subject to change they don't last forever this reflection is what the buddha is trying to tell us that's why buddhism is is very is, is very profound it's not about escaping to something better it is about recognizing the impermanent of the situation the situation is just a situation it is it is impermanent any good thing also is impermanent we have been experiencing good things for the last maybe one or two decades we had prosperity we had good jobs we had career and now one pandemic 20 years of of gain we have two years of loss <laughs> so we, and we are trying to escape from it so yeah so uh, just to clarify mindfulness practice is not escaping mindfulness practice is recognizing reality as it is and doing what is proper to be coping and to live in that reality so that we can be you know we can rise above uh, you know the, the image of the lotus i'm sure you know uh, the image of the lotus is amidst the mud the muddy waters the lotus stands alone i mean the lotus stands purified uh, in the in the muddy water the lotus itself is not soiled by the mud but it comes from the mud it can be like that I think in a nutshell, that's what I think mindfulness practice really means, uh, not a form of escapism. Yeah. Thank you, Didi Niwan. I think that I, I like your answer very much. Thank you. The next question, what happens if one is overindulgent and having OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, then how to put RADA into in place? Well, uh... Okay, I think the first one is about overindulgence. I can, I can, I can empathize with that. Uh, OCD, I, I don't really know what, what OCD means. I mean, obsessive compulsive disorder. I'm not a psychologist, so I'm not the best person to really, I mean, people use the term OCD very loosely these days. I want to arrange my pencil properly. It's called OCD. I want to, you know, I want to, uh, no, I want to have good handwriting. It's called OCD. I want to keep the things that just called OCD. I do not know whether that's OCD. According to my, my psychologist friend, they may have a different, definition of what OCD means because from what my, my good friend uh, you know uh, in, in psychology was telling me that uh, OCD means something more severe you know they really can't get out of that uh, but but um, yeah uh, but maybe if we talk about it overindulgence in the senses um, this is to the Buddha it is a problem <laughs> okay. um, now if you go back to the first sermon uh, or rather popularly called the first sermon of the buddha the dhamma chakka pavatana sutta the first thing that buddha tells the five monks is these two extremes must be avoided uh what are they uh the number one is overindulgence in sensual pleasures overindulgence in gratifying of the senses okay and we do that quite significantly that's something we are typically doing a lot every day actually um, without us realizing we are already indulging in some form of sensual pleasure is whether or not we are overindulgent in it then the other extreme that should be avoided according to the buddha is um the uh, you know torturing yourself okay punishing yourself you know telling yourself it's not all right so there are some religions that says that 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 actually practices to be um not indulgent they go the opposite way to punish yourself so there are some i'm sure you've seen in some documentaries where you know there are people who beat themselves right uh, they beat themselves and they, they torture themselves because by torturing themselves uh they are saying that itself is is good <laughs> okay uh the not good is to indulge so what's good torture yourself punish yourself but the buddha says either these extremes are not right so um <clears throat> so uh, when i've been following um at least i follow ajahn brahm's meditation or ajahn brahmali 
has been saying that the way in which to practice is really not to go to any extreme, but to be at ease, to be at peace, to, be, to just relax. And what it means by relax is not indulging, you know, in, in something called, I watch Netflix and I relax. That's not relaxation. Um, let me give you another example. Maybe it's a lot more is easier. You like durian, Bobby? Yep. You like <laughs> I love durian. I, I think I enjoy durian. I don't know. Uh, again, in, you know, in, in society, even in Malaysia, we have we have big debates about durian. It's either you like it or you hate it, right? So anyway, assuming you like durian, there are people who hate it. There are people who love it. <clears throat> this one, uh, brother uh, Billy Tan has given this example, right? And he says, imagine you have you have the uh, durian, you know, in uh, in your and you bought back brought back durian to the house, and you have people coming to the house, and those who love durian, they have this reaction. <sighs> yeah. Okay. And those who hate durian, you have the other the other reaction. Oh, ooh, you know, so so things like this. So either or, one is a pleasurable reaction. Yay. The other one is a non-pleasurable. Ooh. Either one, you can look at your face. It's 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 tensed up. It's not relaxed. So indulging in a sensual pleasure is not a relaxation in a true sense. Relaxation is no durian. <laughs> okay, so it's just a, a my way of putting it. So yeah, um, I think indulging in sensual overindulgence in sensual pleasures uh, can lead to a lot of bad habits. Um, we you become negligent, we become over, over you know, um, over reliant on the thing that will make you happy. You know, I, I, you know, you want to always look for that thing to keep you happy. You know, so I must have, I must watch my my Korean drama, if not, I, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will not be, be, be all right. You know, that's indulgence, really. I must, uh, you know, uh, I, I must always check my Facebook. Otherwise, the whole day I cannot, I am not at ease. That's already an indulgence. And you know that that indulgence is not getting you anywhere. Okay. So yeah, uh, practice is the same. Reduce them, avoid them if you can. Now, if you can't reduce them, you can't avoid them, then at least do the opposite of them cultivate other habits that will be overcoming the, the, the earlier ones. So I, my example is for at least for the net, for the last one year, I have been, uh, uh, you know, we always have notification uh, sounds on the phone. One of the things I have done is I turn off the, the sound that notifies me for any messages. Because after, because I've, oh, oh, anyway, I, I don't need to reply to any message immediately. Only the ringtone, I, I keep it on in case somebody want to call me. But any messages that come in, so I, I make that happen. And you know what? Until today, I still got withdrawal syndrome. <clears throat> Until today, I still hear notifications, even though the notifications are not there. But I know that I have gradually reduced my reliance on the notification for my, for my sense of security. I used to have, if I don't get any notifications, I, I feel anxious. I don't know what's happening, but now I can safely say, even without a notification, I don't feel as as anxious anymore. So it works. That's called reduction of sensual, uh, this gratifying of the senses. Yeah. Thank you, Brother Newman. Next question. How can we avoid getting sucked into work over time plus being absorbed in work matters after work hours? and prioritize the personal habits and qualities that we want to work on. Yeah, I know work can be very indulgent. I understand that. Uh, some people go to work and because, and I, you know, you spend a lot of time at work. Yes, it's true. You can have a lot of work to do. Uh, but you know, it, I mean, if that is true, when you have a lot of work to do, it's, it, it's all right to, to spend more time in work. I think, I think let's not, let's not be too picky about whether I should knock up at a certain time or not. If there are really urgent things that I really need to get done, there are days I stay up late to finish all my work. There are days I do that. Um, but there are days that things are not as pressing. And yet there are some people who will continue to get into the work thing, no matter how unbusy they are. And the reason for this is very simple. May, for some people, okay, work is an escape. Work is a way in which I can be away from 
what I'm facing at home. Of course, now it's harder because people are working from home. So, but still, I can get very indulged in the work I do. So, the, um, how do I practice the other qualities then if I'm so indulged in this? One of the ways is use that table if you want and list them down. One, the habit that has already arisen in me is over indulgent in work. Put it down there, put it down very big, underline it, bold it, whatever it is, and make that into one of the key things here. And what I would like to cultivate more is other things. For example, time to spend with my children, time to spend with my spouse, okay? And, uh, you know, so things like that. Again, I want to list them down on the, on the right side. So I, 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 if you weigh on both sides, so how do I then tell myself to cultivate that practice of spending more time on the positive side and reduce the one on the left side? The, 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 um, the advice by Stephen Covey, who is the author of The Seven Habits, is very helpful here. And he says, put first things first. And what does he mean by first things? Go back to the other habit, begin with the end in mind. What do I want? Go back to that, to that to that same same thing. What do I really want? Do I want what kind of life do I want? Maybe it helps to visualize the kind of life that you will have in the next one to two years. What kind of life would I would what kind of life would I be? And I, I'm sorry, I'm I'm remembering a song. But anyway, uh, what kind of life would you have when when you have you know in two or three years time? And if you visualize that life. And then you trace back what leads to that life. That's important. That, that end in mind is very important. What kind of life should I have? And that's, that's, that's a very important uh, perspective to look at. If you don't have that perspective, then it's very easy to, to drown in your day to day routines. Don't get me wrong. Routines are important, but routines that are almost like a, you know, you do it on a daily basis, like a robot. And we keep on perpetuating this almost like an autopilot. In fact, there's a study uh, in the, I think it was a UK study where they actually did a questionnaire of all the working people in, uh, you know, in corporate. And one of the questions they asked is, uh, I don't know, know how they phrase the question, but something along the line of, are you aware of what you are doing on a day-to-day -day basis? And, and a lot of the questionnaire they put down there, this is actual study, eh? they, have, they have the data to prove that 80 over percent of people are living their life on autopilot. UK study, and these are working professionals. They are living their life on autopilot. That means the they are just cruising along, autopilot, not really conscious. Things just happen day after day after day after day. And after a few years, they find that they are leading down one way. If you are lucky, it's not too bad. If you're not lucky, you find that Again, these people, they can't cope with stress. They can't cope with, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do I call home life. <laughs> they can't cope with a lot of unhappiness and anxiety. And when one, just one episode happens, like what we are experiencing today, immediately they, they just give up because they have not learned the tools to cope. They have not learned the other things that will help them along the way to lead that kind of life. So yeah, the end in mind is critically important. Without that end in mind, if we keep on living the life in an autopilot, that's where, uh, just like my simile of the garden, weeds grow by themselves. You don't have to grow them. But you need to spend a lot of time cultivating your, your flowers, your bougainvilleas, and whatever not. Okay? So, yeah, that's in a nutshell what I can, how I can maybe give my perspective. Yeah, th thank you, Didi Niwen. I think to add to that, some people or most of us identify our work with our identity what gives us a sense of identity exactly. so we we and also it may be a form of escapism we indulge in work to escape from problems of our daily life okay next question some bad habits are difficult to abandon and to reduce so how much effort and patience to put in sometimes we may lose confidence yeah yeah, I, I, I know that feeling. Um, I, I, I did go through a patch of my life where I feel some things are quite hopeless, actually. You know, I, 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 I think we all have that, that kind of thing that some of these qualities are not so easily abandoned. Um, one of the quality that I 
used to have, which which I still you know I find like quite quite uh, quite present in myself is um, getting uh, irritated and uh, easily when people don't say the things I like them to say. You know, I, I tend to either, either I interrupt them or I get very angry and then I tend to, um, you know, I may not show my anger, but I get very agitated and sometimes I cannot sleep. <laughs> so I do find that it's very hard for me to say I want to get rid of that. And uh, perhaps the words of the Buddha become very helpful here. And I think if I, if I, if I can uh, appreciate what the Buddha is trying to say to us, the path is a gradual path. It is not a path that is a sudden one. And it takes some time before some things can be seen, you know, uh, as, as, um, as a result. So this advice I find is very useful because what the Buddha is trying to tell us is there's no good or bad here in the, in the ultimate sense. What we have is unskillful and skillful. What we have is those things that are not so good that we want to, you know, so, and the, the, the path to, to it is gradual training. And the gradual training has been emphasized so many times in the suttas that it has given me, at least for me, I can say for myself, a lot of hope. It means to say we have hope. There is always hope for something that can get something better and better and better. So there is so the, the it is gratifying to note that nobody's gonna punish us if we don't abandon that bad habit. Put it this way, who knows? Maybe you know, uh, some people may tell us about it, but that's about it. So don't be too hard on ourselves. I think it's important to be gentle with ourselves. Uh, not to be too harsh with whatever we are facing, be generally all right with whatever we have, and tell ourselves that I'm slowly moving towards something better. I think that's the best that I can offer. There's no shortcut and uh, there's no handy plus. I mean, sometimes, you know, you know, handy plus, we put handy plus here, and handy plus there, and all that, but the root cause of it is still back to how we cultivate. So let me give my personal example. Um, if we have not taken good care of our health for a good number of years, just like myself, unfortunately, my physical health is not very, very, very good. And then I got my last, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, medical checkup months ago, uh, and my doctor tells me 90% good, 10% no good. And he says, okay, what is, what is, I say, what is 90% good? And he told me all the good things. What is 10% no good? Oh, your cholesterol is very high. I say, how high? Oh, very high. So, and and I asked, so why 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 is this happening? Oh, you know, not enough this, not enough that, and all that kind of thing. And and it only goes to show one thing. For the last maybe ten years, I have not taken good care of certain aspect of my health. So I'm seeing the result today. Now, is it too late to change? No, I can still change my lifestyle. So maybe I I sleep better, I I, I sleep more, take more fluids, have more exercise, and things like that. That will lead to us, but I can't fix, you know, over the decades of, of 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 that. But I can do something today that will help me. So, gradually over a period of time, hopefully things can improve. So it gives us hope that we can do something about it. It's not something that is suddenly, you know, we can have a miracle pill. Fortunately, um, yeah. Uh, if we find ourselves sometimes demotivated, unmotivated, go back to the Buddha. The Buddha took. Lifetimes, after lifetimes, after lifetimes. What excuse we have? I mean, we sometimes, sometimes I tell myself that to wake myself up. You know, it's only one life, not only one life, not even finished my life yet. Only <laughs> last few years, I mean. So, yeah. So yeah, I, I think that's the best I can offer for now. Thank you, Didi. One last question. Yeah. When one commits suicide, they said that the soul cannot be reborn as it is seen to end one's life. What is your opinion on this? Mm, okay. Uh, I do not know how to best way to answer this. Uh, this is maybe not a practice question, but it's uh, more of a knowledge uh, question. Of course, we Buddhists, we know that we don't have a, 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 a permanent uh, entity called soul. Um, 
we are we are we are made up of what we call the the aggregates uh, kanda uh, pancha kanda rupa vedana sanya sankara vinyana uh, uh, or in in summary our name and form uh, we are made up of what we call this this person is nothing but a process so uh, um, there's no one entity one thing that we can say it moves to the next life so um i like dr puna wong's um if you follow dr puna's breaking myths uh, series i like the way he explained uh, that um when we you know what we call a soul doesn't exist and his analogy is very simple uh he uses this analogy of a lego i'm sure you play lego right you know you put the blocks together so what you have for example is you have uh, you have put together a house okay you build a house using lego bricks <clears throat> and what happens after that is your your parents tell you uh, can you put your lego away okay and what you do is you break apart this house you put it back in the box now his question to us is what happens that house what happened to the house so what happened to the house the house has become a legos in the box so where's the soul you you can't really pinpoint anything that identity i call myself for example if i say i say identify myself as the house the house doesn't exist but the lego still exists then you take the same lego you build a car you build a how uh, you build a, a, a lorry you build a spaceship is it is it the same thing okay so it's not the same and yet it is there's a continuation from the house to the lego is in the blocks to the you know to the to the final one which is the, the, the whatever is built next there's a continuation there's a process so dr puna is trying to say at the end of the day we are recycled <laughs> okay so now i think the question is about you know what what if we commit the, the suicide and i and i think what is a buddhist uh a, a response to that um i suppose it depends a lot on what we have done in our life um i think at the last moment when we die so called what do we remember the most uh we commit suicide thinking it ends the pain that we feel today with the despair and we can't help it so we are trying to get away from it get rid of it by ending the life ending the life is is you know but we know from from buddhist perspective that life doesn't end there it continues into the next life so had if we had a lot of anger hatred frustration uh you know um at what we call that a despair at that moment if we took our life that's a high chance i mean I, i can't say this for sure but i do believe there's a high chance that when we move to the next life we will probably carry the same guilt anger despair frustration into the next life the energy continues right so um in that sense it's not a good idea to commit uh, that of course it's easier said than done because there are people who just can't take it anymore and that's because we didn't have the tools to help us to cope we as buddhists we are fortunate because the buddha gave us very very simple straightforward i will call them tools tools to help us to cope to live to understand see reality and don't do things to don't do stupid things okay so i think this is where the practice is while we are still all right healthy sound mind able to i think it's good to cultivate and practice so that good good, good qualities overshadow the bad ones so when the time comes if a, if a pandemic happens if a, if a, you know bad situation happens we have the tools to cope we can't solve the problem but we have the tools to cope and i think that's more important than saying you know can be solve the world's problems uh so yeah that's the best that we can offer yeah. yeah but on the on on whether you want to understand more about the soul and all that please follow dr puna's uh breaking myths uh you know series uh i think it's on friday if i'm not mistaken so uh, there will be there will be something helpful for us to have a, get a better understanding about how uh, rebirth and birth and all that kind of thing happens so. hey bobby yeah thank thank you uh did you want for your 
very practical sharing. For those who would like to understand or to know more about Rebirth Souls, come back for our next sharing on the 18th of July. This talk will be at 4 p.m. for the 18th of July, where we are inviting all the way from Australia, Achan Sujato. Achan Sujato is also a disciple of Achan Brahm, and he is the main person behind the creation of the Sutta Central. We actually translated all the sutras in, and put it online, for, available for free for everybody. So come in to, for, to listen to Achan Sujato. He'll be sharing on real cool, Nibbana, what it is and what it isn't. So, okay, thank you, Niwan. I think Niwan has stressed that the, the main emphasis of the practice is on gradual reduction of, and stress the word gradual, of bad qualities and gradual improvement of skillful qualities. And he has also shared with us some very actionable plans where we can use it to improve the good qualities in our lives. And I think Brother Niwan has more than achieved his objective of inspiring us to practice the Dhamma and uh, to treat this as a very gradual practice to improve our lives. Thank you, Dina Niwan. And uh, he's also, a, I think, a good example of uh, how we can all inspire and aspire to be lay speakers. Because uh, as we all know, during the pandemic, if you were to go to Brickfields now and look for monks, you only find two or three monks. And uh, same with Sento. So we have very few local Sangha. So all the more where we need local lay people to come forth and share the Dhamma. Okay. And I thank Didini Wen for taking the step to be one of us, uh, to be one of the speakers and also to inspire us to share the same. Okay.